We're delighted to have Joe Mitchell as the, uh, the speaker for today's uh, theory seminar at UIUC. So Joe is a distinguished professor at Stony Brook and uh, he's a renowned computational geometer, has won many awards, including uh, the Goido Prize, uh, which he shared with uh, Sanjay uh, Aurora on PTAS for Euclidean TSP. So uh, Joe is going to talk about some ex exciting new results on independent set for rectangles. So Joe, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you very much, Timothy. So I feel like I'm uh, preaching to the experts here since uh, much of the work on the, uh, on the subject that I'll be speaking about has been done by, uh, by Timothy and, and Sariel and, and some of your collaborators. Uh, so this, this involves a uh, paper I recently posted on archive. It's a topic I've been working on off and on for quite a long time. This will be the first time that I'm speaking about this. In fact, I made the slides over the last 24 hours. So please uh, forgive any typos or errors or anything. And uh, I welcome feedback, of course. So first of all, the maximum independent set problem uh, is well known uh, in, in graphs. Uh, it's notoriously hard to approximate. The best known approximation factor that you can achieve in polynomial time is uh, nearly linear, so that's really bad. And in fact, there's good evidence that you can't do substantially better than that unless you have some structure. Now in planar graphs, they have a lot of structure. So PTASs have been known for a long time there. We're particularly interested today in geometric instances of maximum independent set where the graph, underlying graph uh, that we're exploring comes from the intersection graph of some kind of geometric objects things like disks, squares, rectangles, fat regions, pseudo disks, polygons, et cetera, et cetera. And essentially all of these are hard as well and we're interested in, uh, in approximations. I guess one exception to that is I had a paper not long ago about outer string graphs, maximum independent set, even weighted maximum independent set and outer string graphs is polynomial time. But the others that you see here, unless there's many more assumptions made, are all at least NP-hard. So it's a basic geometry problem given a set of bodies. In the, it, today's talk will be exclusively in two dimensions, although we're thinking about higher dimensional versions as well. Um, given a set of bodies in the plane, find a maximum cardinality subset that's pairwise disjoint. That's the way to phrase it in the geometric setting. The particular geometric setting we're talking about today is maximum independent set for rectangles. And these are axis aligned rectangles. So your input looks something like this and your output should look something like this where it's a large collection of uh, interior disjoint elements from the input set. So since it's hard, we're interested in approximations. And if you have uh, disks or more generally fat regions, then you can achieve a PTAS. You can get arbitrarily close to, to one. Uh, of course, the running time will depend on the epsilon, uh, the, the degree of closeness to, the, to, to one is the approximation factor. And Timothy has worked on this as have others. Uh, the, the best bound that I know of is, is that of Timothy's. Um, and there's also PTASs for the special case of pseudo disks. Uh, that Timothy and Sariel have worked on. Uh, but as you know, rectangles are neither fat nor pseudo disk. So um, they require different techniques. And some really interesting work has emerged in recent years. There's QPTASs, quasi polynomial time approximation schemes. Uh, I believe the best running time currently is this one. Um, and for certain special cases, Sariel and uh, collaborators have uh, done a PTAS for so-called long rectangles, where each rectangle has one of its two dimen dimensions is at least a constant fraction of the uh, bounding box of all of the input. Um, the best polynomial time approximation factor though, has been, uh, well, originally it was log n, and then it became log log n after a significant breakthrough. Um, there's also been some recent parameterized, uh, so there's a PAS, uh, parameterized approximation scheme, 
uh, that gives you uh, an output that depends on the parameter, which is this parameter k in this, in this setting. But here, the focus of today's talk is really what I've posted in my recent archive preprint, which is a constant factor approximation that's uh, achievable in polynomial time. So one approach that would lead you to this result is, is to show that if I give you a set of disjoint rectangles, any set of disjoint rectangles in the plane, uh, perhaps the hypothesized elements of the optimal set, then there exists a constant fraction subset that has a so-called perfect BSP, orthogonal BSP, where, I, where I'm cutting uh, with um, uh, axis parallel cuts and I'm respecting all of the rectangles. If that were the case, then, then you would have a constant, uh, a constant factor approximation in polynomial time just by using DP to recursively optimize over the set of um, of uh, subproblems that would be just rectangles in this case, rectangular subproblems. Um, but as this example, uh, you know, sort of in, in the middle, this sort of cycle of, of skinny rectangles shows uh, there, there may not be, you know, this does not have a, a perfect BSP, but uh, three quarters of it does. I mean, so, so here I've shown in blue that, that uh, if, if you allow me to get rid of Roughly a quarter of them, then then there is a, uh, a a perfect BSP, and I'm not sure what the latest or or best uh, knowledge about this problem is. Uh, I know a number of people have thought about it off and on, including myself, and that was certainly a starting point for the work that I'm talking about today. But I kept getting stuck, so I'll I'll leave this as a conjecture. If you can prove the conjecture, then you give an alternative proof to what I'm presenting today. So the main ideas, um, since I got stuck trying to prove that, was to, uh, first of all, generalize uh, the cuts. So instead of just straight through cuts, I'm going to allow cuts that look like that and other, other such constant complexity uh, cuts that break into not just rectangles, but because I have non-straight cuts, I get these things that I call CCRs. That's not Creedence Clearwater Revival. That's a corner clipped rectangle. <clears throat> so I'll end up with shapes like that. And I'll be using constant complexity cuts of axis parallel segments to achieve it. But I even got stuck um, doing that uh, unless I allowed myself to have k uh, partition instead of just binary, um, there's one case of, of uh, my analysis that uh, requires, in fact, five subpieces, where you might be partitioning a CCR into five CCRs. But basically, it's going to be a partitioning scheme uh, where the uh, elements, the, the faces in the partition correspond to CCRs, and cuts will be axis parallel um, sets of segments that achieve CCR partitioning. And underlying the analysis is a charging scheme. And sort of everything is based on what, what will enable the charging scheme to work. I mean, that's essentially, you know, so all of this has been reverse engineered. Um, you know, I'm trying to achieve a certain result. What do I need to get there? Um, and so I define this notion of a nearly perfect CCR partition, and I'll define that shortly. Once you have those tools in place in the structure theorem, then it's just dynamic programming to optimize over this class of allowed partitions, and that will yield the algorithm. So first, some preliminaries. Um, the input consists of n axis-aligned rectangles. You can assume without loss of generality that they have integral coordinates. I let b denote the bounding box, axis-aligned bounding box of the input set. I speak about a segment, often I use sigma, penetrates a rectangle if it intersects the interior of that rectangle. Um, and a segment crosses a rectangle if it not only penetrates it, but the intersection set is a, in the interior of that segment. So for example, in this figure, the vertical segment sigma crosses R1. It does not penetrate R3, 
and it penetrates but does not cross because it ends right here, the rectangle R2. So what's a corner clipped rectangle? Well, it's not a very inventive uh, name for it. Um, you take a rectangle and you clip its corners by subtracting rectangles. I mean, so you get this orthogonally convex shape of bounded complexity. Uh, so, you know, has at most whatever 12 sides. And I have a labeling scheme where, you know, the, the top uh, consists of at most three edges. T, T minus is to the left, T plus is to the right, and similar for the bottom left and right sides of a CCR. Of course, a rectangle is a CCR. It's just a special case, and you get many other shapes, L's and Z's and pluses and things like that. So these are all CCRs. They're constant complexity regions, orthogonally convex polygons. Um, so another notion I need is that of maximal rectangles. So take the magenta rectangles here, and I'm going to transform this set of K uh, interior disjoint rectangles into uh, a set of so-called maximal uh, interior disjoint rectangles. Um, and we'll be using these max, we'll be using maximality to, to come up with our structure result. So let me just illustrate this with an animated example. So here's a set of interior disjoint blue rectangles. I will extend them as much as I can vertically, and then to the left, and then down, and then to the right. And what I end up with are a set of maximal rectangles that cannot be grown any further locally uh, in any of the four uh, directions, but they remain interior disjoint. So now I've converted, uh, potentially converted a set of K uh, rectangles, maybe the set of my, op you know, my optimal set into uh, maximal rectangles. And the reason for that, uh, I'll try to make clear in a moment. But I also define a notion of nesting among maximal rectangles. So we say like in this example, R is nested to its left because his left boundary is interior to the abutting boundary of a neighboring, you know, of a neighboring rectangle, the blue one. Um, so it is nested uh, to the left. So in this figure and my coloring scheme, I let red denote rectangles that are horizontally nested. So they're nested to the left, right, or both. Uh, so for instance, R1 is nested on his left. He's not nested on his right because his, his right interval is not a in the interior of this rectangle, uh, of that rectangle's left side. R2 is blue because he's nested, actually he's nested above and below. And R3 is not nested to the left or to the right. So the gray rectangles are not nested in any direction and the horizontally nested left, right, or both are red and the uh, vertically nested ones are blue. And I do consider the, um, uh, the, 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 the side of B. So, so this, this rectangle is nested because you can imagine that the, the left wall is an abutting rectangle. Okay, just convention. So why is maximality useful to me? Um, it's useful because if you look at a rectangle like this one, uh, it cannot be, uh, it, if, it's, if it's maximal, it cannot be nested both vertically and horizontally. Whereas if it were not maximal, as in this figure, uh, then you see that uh, to, you know, a, Above, actually, so when I said abutting, um, I, I should have said, you know, projected. So, so his his top projects to the interior of that. His right projects to the interior of that rectangle. And this um, nesting relationship could happen in in two directions if you didn't have maximality. But if you have maximality, then this guy is nesting above. He cannot be nesting to the right or to the left because those dashed rectangles that would have to exist somehow for that to be true uh, would imply a, a conflict uh, in the vicinity of the northwest and northeast corners of R prime sub i. 
So why is the nesting concept useful? Well, this comes from just thinking about um, natural approaches to charging schemes. So what's going to happen when, you, I mean, the, the reason that we're interested in these recursive cuttings is that when we cut along some, some polygonal chains, or in my case, it's all going to be axis parallel cuts. So this, this vertical segment is one piece of a cut. If I, if I cross a rectangle, and um, therefore I, I intend to discard it if I'm looking for um, a uh, perfect or a near perfect partitioning that respects the rectangles, then because the cut crosses this rectangle, um, I have to discard it. Um, I, I'm looking for somebody to charge that rectangle to. If I look to the right, because I have this nesting relationship, I don't see a feature that I can charge it to. There, there could be millions of, of rectangles R that abut this particular blue rectangle R prime. Um, and so I don't have a feature to charge. But if I look here to the left, it is not nesting to the left. And there will, I'll argue that there exists a feature, a corner of some rectangle that I can charge that can pay for getting rid of this rectangle. Okay. So what's a CCR partition? It's a recursive partitioning that starts with the bounding box of the input rectangles. Uh, each face, I usually use Q as a face, is a CCR. So it has this special constant complexity shape. Um, a cut consists of a set of a constant number of horizontal and vertical segments that partition a CCR face into a constant number of subfaces. In my case, five suffices. In almost all cases, two or three subfaces suffice, but there's one case where I actually need five. Um, and we say a CCR partition is perfect with respect to a set of input rectangles if no rectangle is penetrated by any of the cut segments, any of the line segments that make up the cut. Uh, and each leaf face has exactly one input rectangle. So just like we do with perfect BSPs. But I need a notion of so-called nearly perfect CCR partition where I'm gonna allow some of the, the cut segments in either all of the vertical ones or all of the horizontal ones. It'll be one or the other, depending on a, an assumption um, to be penetrated by at most two input rectangles. And the reason two is that a uh, vertical uh, segment uh, can penetrate but not cross two rectangles and everybody else that he penetrates will be crossed. But at the ends, the two comes from the fact that a segment has two endpoints, let's put it that way. Okay. So here's an example of, uh, in this case, I took a rectangle and I did a, a binary cut into two CCRs. Here's a CCR partitioned by a cut into three subfaces that are CCRs. And here's a five-way partitioning of a CCR into five CCRs. And here's a picture of a CCR partition. The first level of the hierarchy is the purple. The second is the red. The third is the blue. And the fourth is the greens. OK, this is how you should picture what's going on. And a nearly perfect CCR will have the input rectangles uh, look like this, where possibly I have some limited amount of penetration. Actually, here I show two crossing. It'll be a property of, of the, the interaction of my uh, vertical cuts with uh, input rectangles, will, or actually it's with the maximal rectangles. So actually with the minimal, with the original rectangles, it, they may be crossing, but with the maximal ones, which have been extended until they become maximal, um, I will be penetrating them and therefore possibly crossing uh, two of the original rectangles. So here's the main structure theorem. So this is the main thing you have to prove. Uh, for any input set of K interior disjoint axis aligned rectangles, there exists a K area with K at most five, CCR partition of the bounding box. 
that recursively cuts into CCRs uh, so that the CCR partition is nearly perfect. So every cut has the near perfection um, assumption of you know, this constant number two, <clears throat> two uh, at most two rectangles penetrated along, it'll actually be along either the vertical portions or the horizontal portions. But uh, you'll see, I quickly make an assumption where uh, I'll focus on the vertical and the other is symmetric. And the particular constant fraction, so I am arguing that there exists a constant fraction subset that has a um, near perfect CCR partition uh, is at least one tenth. Now that that's a relatively crude analysis, and I uh, I'm quite confident uh, that that I, I can improve that, and I'll say something about that in the conclusion. So I think the the factor will be somewhere between a factor two and a factor ten is what this method seems to give. And if I were to guess, uh, uh, I, I think three is probably the right number for this particular analysis. So the dynamic programming subproblem in the algorithm will consist of a CCR that has constant complexity. So it's easily specified in the grid of integers that support the input rectangles. Uh, so that's part of the subproblem. The other part of the subproblem is this information about the particular special rectangles that are allowed to cross uh, the some of the ed uh, the edges. So, um, so in this case, uh, you know, on this vertical edge, I, I specified one. On this vertical side, I specified one. I specified one. Here, there's one crossing, and I mean, th this is not crossed. This is just. Uh, on the grid, here's another one that's crossed, but potentially there would be two on, on any one of the sides. So then the, uh, the, the recursion of the dynamic program is going to recursively evaluate the, the value function of the uh, recursion, f of s, which is the maximum cardinality of an independent subset of input rectangles uh, for which there is a nearly perfect CCR partition. And here, you're, since I'm breaking into capital K faces, where K is at most five, you're going to sum up the, the values of those subproblems. That's how many rectangles are associated with, with them, plus the ones that straddle the cut. You know, so these are the special ones that are going to be specified across uh, portions of the cut. Um, and you optimize in the usual dynamic programming way. You, 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 tabulate this. So the base of the recursion happens here. And um, if you crudely count the number of subproblems and the amount of information, et cetera, you'll come up with a crude count of n to the 34. Uh, that can be drastically improved, I believe. But for purposes of simplicity, I'll just say n to the 34. And again, I think the factor of 1 tenth can be improved. Uh, but uh, the, the paper currently has the analysis that shows one tenth. That's the structure here. Okay, so that's the algorithm. What I haven't shown yet is the proof of the structure theorem. And that of course is where all the effort is. Let me pause for a moment and ask if there's any questions before I dive into this. Anything or I've put everybody to sleep. Okay. But, uh, is there, uh, I is there anything, uh, I mean, it's very crucial that's unweighted, uh, any? Okay, so good question about the weight. I'll make, so you, you'll see where at the moment it's unweighted, yeah. So, um, and I can suggest how I'm thinking about uh, generalizing it to the case of weights, but that's a great question. That'll be on the conclusion slide, is what, uh, what can I do for weighted rectangles and um, maximum weight independent set? So I believe it's going to work, uh, but it needs uh, it, it needs a, uh, a a modification, and you'll see where that comes because because I'm going to be charging um, each crossed rectangle to a feature. Instead, I would want to 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 charge the weight of the crossed rectangle to features that have at least enough weight to pay for that crossing. And that's the game that I'm trying to play right now in generalizing this to the weighted case. So more about that later. Thanks. Um, 
Okay, so uh, I yeah, go can, ahead. Can you can you refresh the definition of perfect and also the can you state the structure theorem again? Yeah. So okay. So first of all, uh, nearly, uh, perfect. nearly perfect means that uh, you're allowed to to cross some of the or penetrate or cross some of the rectangles, but only two per side, two per edge at most. It'll actually be two per vertical edge um, or in the rotated problem, two per horizontal edge. Uh, so something like this, the input, so, so this is an example showing a CCR partition uh, that is nearly perfect. So it's respecting the rectangles, except that um, on some of the edges of the cutting. Uh, so each cut consists of a constant number of horizontal and vertical segments that partition a CCR into at most five sub CCRs. Um, and I allow only a constant, namely two rectangles intersecting or crossing um, the, uh, each boundary segment. And the structure theorem is saying that for any set of K interior disjoint rectangles, for instance, the K rectangles that, that are an optimal set, there exists a subset of them for which there is a nearly perfect CCR partition for that subset. Okay, so that's what we're gonna to try to prove. And this, the subset is a constant fraction. At least one tenth, yes. So I, I'm going to define a process whereby I discard rectangles that are crossing cuts that I want to make, but I will pay for those um, rectangles that are crossed with features. And then the charging scheme will keep track of everything that has been discarded. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. So it's good to show that structure theorem again because now I'm gonna to try to prove it. Um, so I give you these K rectangles that are interior disjoint. Maybe they're the set of optimal rectangles. I let I prime be their modification where I make them maximal, right? Their maximal expansions. Um, and in their maximal expansions, now I'm using that to classify rectangles into these three categories, red, blue, or gray. So red rectangles are those that are nested horizontally, meaning to the left or to the right. Blue are nested uh, vertically, like this is nested vertically, both above and below. This one is nested to the left. It's also nested to the right. Um, and gray rectangles are those that are not nested at all. There might not be any gray ones. Um, now, without loss of generality, uh, we can assume that um, the uh, number of uh, red rectangles is at most k over two. So the number of non-red rectangles is at least k over two, okay? So that's the, the assumption that's going to sort of make you know, vertical and horizontal special for the remainder of the argument. But of course, it could have been the other way that the blue was at most k over two. But uh, you know that at least one of those two sets is, is at most k over two because it's a partition into those three sets. And, and it's that partition that that came from the maximality, okay? So non-red rectangles constitute at least half of the total set. Now my goal is to keep, you know, to keep a subset. So I'm gonna recursively partition. Uh, and when I find cuts, uh, if I unfortunately cross some of my rectangles, then those have to be thrown away. My goal is to pay for the ones that I throw away in such a way that I can argue that the number that I retain at the very end is omega k. It'll be at least k over 10, and I think much better than that. Um, so the first observation is that I, I'm dealing with these uh, maximal rectangles, the expansions. But of course, since they contain the original rectangles, 
if you have a CCR partition that's nearly perfect with respect to their the maximal versions, then uh, because the original rectangles are sim are smaller than the maximal ones, then it's still nearly perfect with respect to the original. So now I'm going to define a process of selecting this subset of my K maximal rectangles that have been classified as red, blue, or gray. And I'm assuming that at least half of them are non-red. So initially, all of the rectangles are active. They're in my active set. During the process, I'll be discarding, making them some of them inactive. And I need a charging scheme to convince you that I'm not discarding too many. So that the number of active ones at the end is at least one tenth, that I've discarded at least, at most, nine tenths of the original rectangles. So I start with the bounding box of the input set, and we recursively partition it into CCRs. Uh, and uh, any face that has more than one rectangle in it, I'm going to try to cut it. OK, so here is a CCR, and I'm going to try to cut it into sub-CCR faces in most five of them with, say, this purple set of edges that make, a, make up a cut. Uh, but, you know, I, I might be crossing some of the rectangles, and, you know, if I can do it without crossing anything, then great. I'll go ahead and do it. That's what we often call a free cut. But in general, uh, there may not be a free cut, and I have to cross some and discard some of the rectangles. So let's look at the properties of a cut. So it consists of horizontal segments and vertical segments. The horizontal segments in my scheme will not penetrate any rectangle. They'll always be on uh, either uh, on, on boundaries of, of rectangles is fine, but they will never penetrate a rectangle. Um, vertical portion, like I've drawn here, sigma, uh, could potentially cross. So these, these are crossed. And this one is penetrated, but not crossed. Um, so that, that's my notion. Penetrate, cross, and vertical portions are what I need to worry about. Now, vertical is special because of my earlier assumption about the, you know, the non-reds are at least k over 2. If it was the non-blues, then I would be worried about the horizontal cuts. But I'm focusing on vertical cuts because of that assumption. So I want to define a notion of a rectangle being exposed. And again, there's preference for the direction based on my earlier assumption. I'm going to speak about being exposed to the left or to the right. So this rectangle here, it has four corners. Each corner is an integer coordinate. Um, the way I write it in the papers, I shift inward by a half. So this is half integral. That's just to be precise about a point that's just inside. And I fire a ray to the right or to the left until I hit the boundary of the CCR that I live within. And I say that R is exposed or, or that that corner of R is exposed to the left or to the right according to whether or not that ray uh, penetrates any rectangles. So here you penetrated that. So this corner is not exposed. But this corner is exposed to the right. This corner is not exposed to the left because he penetrates. And this is why I did this little perturbation where I brought the corner in a little bit. So these two rectangles, R and R prime, share a top edge coordinate, as is often the case. When you do these maximal rectangles, they share a lot of coordinates. So these share that coordinate, and, and you are uh, penetrating here. So you're not exposed to the left. And this one, you are exposed to the left. So I'll often speak of the top or bottom edge of a uh, rectangle being exposed to the left or to the right. By the way, th this corner is also exposed to the right because this ray does not penetrate any other rectangles. It, it obviously penetrates R itself. But this is the definition, the notion of being exposed to the left or to the right. Now, when you make a cut, so focus on a vertical portion of some cut, which is partitioning one CCR into sub-CCRs. Here's a vertical portion. Remember, horizontal portions will never penetrate a rectangle. But a vertical portion can penetrate rectangles. 
Here it's it's crossed three rectangles. Once it 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 crosses those rectangles, then R1, R2, and R3 are going to become exposed, right? Because I'm going to remove. So as a, in the process of, of making this cut, I'm going to remove these three rectangles. That's the way the process is going to work. Whenever I, I cross with, with a vertical cut, I cross a rectangle, I discard that rectangle. Um, and this will lead to some rectangles becoming exposed. And here's a key. Uh, a, a key fact that I'm using, or or, or a, a concept that I that I'm defining here, that of fences or obstacles. So when a rectangle becomes exposed, so you know this is going to be a new CCR on the left side of the cut, and this will be a new CCR over here. This portion of the cut is part of the boundary, shared boundary between the two, and R2 has become exposed to his right. So when he's exposed to his right, I draw a blue fence that includes his bottom, or in this case, his bottom, it could have been his top. Uh, it includes the corresponding top or bottom of the rectangle and the horizontal segment joining it to the boundary. And similarly, I, I have these fences, the, the red fences. And the fences, you imagine them as obstacles. I'm not going to, I, I, I'm going to, for, for the next, uh, iteration of my recursive cutting, I'm not going to let you uh, make any cuts that cross any of these segments. That, that's a new constraint. Okay. So I establish these as obstacles, fences. Here's a more elaborate example. Took me a while to draw this one uh, with uh, these, uh, um, uh, I guess I I colored some of the rectangles red and the non-reds are all gray. So some of those are blue, but I just did red and gray as the non-reds. And the, the, in the original bounding box, you know, the, the fences are these highlighted uh, blue and uh, red segments that correspond to currently exposed rectangles, exposed to the left or to the right. And when I make a cut along this vertical portion, in this case, it's a, it's a simple vertical line cut uh, into two sub rectangles. But this, uh, the X's indicate rectangles that get discarded, which could be red ones or non red ones. And the little black dots represent these half integral points just inside the corners that are now becoming exposed because their rays meet the cut line without penetrating any rectangles. Once I discard the ones that have X's on them. So this is meant as an example. So the important thing is my fence invariant. So I make sure that I establish these. Hi, Joe, uh, can, yes. I can you go back sure. to the previous picture? Uh, this one? Yeah, I'm a little confused. So the, uh, the, the, the gray here, uh, sorry, uh, so the, the crosses are the rectangles you killed. By that cut, yes. So, so because the, they're the ones that are crossed. Which, that's not a really a, that's an open space, is it? The white? Uh, yeah, but it, I'm confused by the gray rectangle you have. Ah, I see, maybe it's just that they are maximal, so. That they are maximal, yeah. I see, see. so I see that, that in fact, uh, in the middle, those are two rectangles which are, if you're speaking about here, there are yeah. two rectangles. You, you can't see their boundary because it's covered up by the ah, green, okay, okay. So, so green the, cut. The, the, so those are two separate rectangles, each of which is exposed. That's that's what these uh, witnesses ah, okay. give you. And, and so they, those are not killed by the vertical line. They're just... Uh, that, that's right. Those are not killed by the vertical because they're not crossed. Yeah. Right? Okay. And they're not even penetrated, let alone crossed. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. just, I, I was just trying to make sure that I understood. Yeah. Sure. So the fence invariant says that uh, whenever a rectangle is exposed, either to the left or the right, you know, because of its top or bottom becoming exposed, uh, we establish a fence. So th this is just something, it's an invariant we maintain by induction. Um, and that anchors such rectangles to the left and right. 
And then we're, we're never going to produce cuts that cross fences. They become sacred and uh, protected. They are obstacles. So here, for instance, is the set of initial fences for this set. Uh, here I have red, blue, and gray, but um, the, the full color scheme. Um, and the rectangles with R's in them are the anchored rectangles that um, have their top, bottom, top and or bottom uh, exposed to the left or right. And I use the convention that, yeah, I'm misusing red and blue. I'm using red and blue in two different ways. So now red fences are anchored on the left, blue fences are anchored on the right. It's just a visual cue. So there's a key technical lemma um, which basically says, if you give me a, a CCR face cue with any set of horizontal segments anchored on its left and right sides, any set of horizontal segments attached to its left boundaries, remember it has up to three left sides and it, up to three right sides because it's a CCR. Whatever you do there, there will be a way to, to produce a, a, a cut into at most five subfaces, each of which is CCR, that respects the fences in the sense that all the horizontal segments of my cut will be along fences. The verticals will never cross a fence. They could, they could abut it. They could dead end into a fence. That's OK. But they will not cross a fence. Um, and it'll actually turn out, and this is important as well, that there's uh, uh, the, the horizontal stabbing number of the vertical segments is bounded. In, in particular, it's at most two because you'll actually see that there's at most two vertical cut segments in this set of horizontal and vertical edges uh, that constitute a cut. So some care is needed. I mean, th this uh, is not immediately obvious that this holds. Um, so it's not enough to just say, oh, well, because I'm using these constant complexity things like straight cuts and L's and Z's, um, uh, that I will just keep getting CCR faces because obviously I could do that cut and what used to be a CCR face up here now is not a CCR face because it has this staircase to it and it's not this constant complexity CCR. So, so this would not be a valid way to cut this. It produced a CC, I mean, this is CCR, that's CCR, but F is not. So you, you need care. And so the proof is a long case analysis. And I'm not going to bore you with this. I'm going to show you some images of the case analysis and tell you some of the basic ideas. There's many ways I'm sure that you could structure the case analysis. Actually, I've gone through two or three different ones during the write-up myself. I broke it into these three cases where I partitioned on what happens with respect to what I call beta bar. So beta bar is among all of the fences, the blue fences anchored on the right side of the CCR, if there are any, among all of them, pick the one that has the leftmost left endpoint. They're all attached to the right boundary of the CCR, but one of them extends furthest left. And if there are ties, it doesn't matter. So take one of those, beta bar, and now, it breaks into cases of whether beta bar is anchored on this part of the CC. So on the right side of a CCR, there's potentially three right edges, R minus, R plus, and R. So it turns out uh, you, it, it's different whether beta bar is anchored on R or on R plus. Of course, R minus is symmetric, it turns out. There's also a special case that comes up in the two subcases, in the subcases to cases one and two, where I drop into this special case where I say the, the middle gray region. So this is where the left wall is separated from the right wall. So up here, notice that the left wall and the right wall are not separated. There is a sta horizontal stabbing line, but here the left wall and the right wall are separated, and that gives rise to what I call the gray rectangle. And if you have fences anchored 
to the left and right sides of this gray rectangle that overlap. That is, if you project them onto the x-axis, uh, there's no gap. So here, the, I mean, there might be millions of red and blue fences anchored on the sides. I, I'm not drawing all of them, I'm just illustrating. But there's no vertical separator of the red and blue fences within the gray rectangle. So those are the three primary cases for which I drew figures. And I have to admit, this is this paper, I, I invested the most time I've ever spent drawing figures for a paper. There, there are 60 detailed figures in this case analysis, and there's probably another. 20 or 30 detailed figures in the rest of the paper. But these 60 detailed figures and the case analysis, which is enumerated in the appendix, you know, roughly goes you know, like this. So here is my beta bar. It extends as far to the, I, I'm not drawing all of the blue uh, fences, uh, but, I, but I say, okay, from this endpoint, fire upwards, what can happen? Well, you could hit, uh, T minus, you could hit T, you could hit T plus. You, if you hit T plus, then you can't just make this cut because that would create a non-CCR because you've got this. So you actually have to drop into subcases for this where you look at what happens when you go down. You could hit B minus, you could hit B, you could hit B plus. You could hit a red fence. You won't hit a blue fence because remember I picked, you know, beta bar is the one is a blue fence that extends as far to the left as possible. So when you fire these rays up and down, you will not hit another blue fence. You could hit a top or bottom of the of the CCR, or you could hit a red fence, and the red fence could be anchored on L minus, or it could be anchored on L or it could be anchored on L plus, and then you get into more subcases, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes you get into these cases where, I, uh, where, where it requires separation of L and R, horizontal separation, and I draw this gray rectangle and I refer you to case three. So this is also case three. But the cuts that you see here are highlighted these thick green things. So this is an L cut that partitioned it into two. This is an L cut that partitioned it into two. This is like a T cut that partitioned into three pieces. Here is a uh, set of what, three horizontal and one vertical segments that partition into one, two, three, four CCRs. And I'm very careful in every one of these cases to make sure that every face is a CCR. Um, and if you look through all of these cases, you'll see in this case, there's never more than one vertical segment. It's always a vertical segment caused by firing rays up and down from an endpoint. There's one vertical segment. The others are horizontal and they are subsegments of fences. In case two, here are the subcases. This is where beta bar is anchored on R plus. So it's up here or symmetrically on R minus. So I didn't draw the other uh, symmetric case. So I am exploiting symmetry in only showing you 60 figures. Uh, so again, this partitions into two with an L cut. This is partitioned into two. This is partitioned into three. If you look over again, it's the thick green are the actual cuts. And you'll see there's some of them that partition into three pieces, some many into two. Some of them drop into the gray case. The gray case, uh, I refer you to case three. So that'll be the next slide. Um, and I drop into that. But again, in all of these cases, there's at most one vertical segment in the cut. And, it, and in this case, at most three pieces. So it's case three gets you here. So this is the gray rectangle case. Um, and you, you could end up like this, where if there exists a blue fence that points downward to a red fence or a red fence that points upward to a blue fence, then you get a nice simple binary split into two CCRs. 
But if that's not the case, then you have to drop into more subcase analysis of what goes on inside that gray rectangle. And these five, uh, I'm sorry, these subcases, 3C, result in five pieces. You see that I'm partitioning in five pieces. And importantly, you'll see that I finally am using two vertical segments in my cut. But because there's only two, the horizontal stabbing number of my cut edges is still only two. And that's what's crucial to the analysis. OK, so we're almost done. Here is an example. Again, this took a long time to draw. So here I took a, a full example of rectangles uh, in, in this original one. I have the original uh, anchored fences left and right. I do the, the cuts, the partitions, and then I'm sort of separating the pieces. I ran out of space, so it comes down here. And uh, this piece comes down here. And this piece comes down here, and et cetera. So it's, you know, I needed a much bigger space, but this is one example of the full partitioning on an example. All right. Um, remember, fences are obstacles. They are not cut. And the anchored rectangles that define the fences are not allowed to be cut. That, that's a property of this technical lemma. OK, so you can penetrate one of these rectangles, which means, of course, since he's a maximal version of an original rectangle, the original rectangle might be here. And so the original rectangle might, in fact, be crossed. But um, you'll penetrate at most two and cross the others. OK, so since there's at most two vertical cut segments, remember, only in case three did you even get the two, like I had here. Um, you always know that if I give you a vertical cut segment on one of the two sides, at least one of the two sides, there's no other vertical cut segment. Okay, and that's going to be important in just a second. So my goal is to charge off the non-red rectangles that are crossed by the vertical cut segment. They're going to be charged off. The red ones I'm not going to charge, but they're accounted for because remember, there's not too many red ones. That allows the generality number of reds was less or equal to k over two. So the number of non-reds is at least k over two. OK, so how do you do the charging? So here is a rectangle R that is being crossed by a portion of a vertical cut. Now, I'm assuming with that loss generality, there's no vertical cut to the right. It could have been or to the left. OK, but to the right. So I take. Uh, this point near this corner, and I fire a ray to the right. You know, it's, it's half it's half integral offset. It penetrates somebody. If it doesn't, then it's already that then uh, then it's already anchored. So it penetrates somebody. That somebody has his top either at or above R. This row, he's at level R. This row. He's above level R, the top of R. If he's at the top of R, then his bottom is either below R, as in these two cases, or it's above R, as in these two cases. Now, if he's now he's either abutting R or he's not, as in this case. If he's abutting R, then the corner I charge is his northwest corner. If he's not abutting, I claim this actually can't happen because his bottom is down here. This gray region that is between them, this violates maximality. Either, either there exists some rectangle in this, in this gray rectangle or there doesn't. If there doesn't, then R is not maximal. He would have expanded against it. If there is a rectangle, there exists one whose top edge is topmost. But he is not up against this side. That violates the maximality again. OK? 
And then similarly here, if the bottom of, of this is, is above that, I, I get the same case. Basically, one and two is no different from three and four. In cases five and six, I'm penetrating this rectangle to my right, and his top is above mine. And in this case, I'm abutting. Then I charge the southwest corner. If he's not abutting, as in case six, then look at this, this rectangle, the gray rectangle. I claim there cannot be any other rectangle inside because if there were, there would be a topmost one and he would not be maximal. So this gray rectangle is empty, which means that you have uh, this, ex this exposure. That, that is that, you, that I'm going to be able to charge this corner. And once I make this cut, this rectangle will be anchored to that cut. These other two cases can't happen Case seven can't happen because it would imply that R is red, that it's nested to its right because the top is above R's top, the bottom is below. And there can't be a gap between them for the similar reasons to before. So this is a complete case analysis of what the local geometry looks like for a crossed non-red rectangle R. So, my charging scheme, I charge these corners, but no corner is ever charged more than once. Once it's charged, you establish the fence, you attach, it will never, that corner will never be charged. The other side might be. If we charge a corner, then this rectangle was not previously crossed because if it had been previously crossed and discarded, then if you look at these, you know, if this had been crossed, then at the moment it was crossed, the, the corner of R became exposed and R would have been anchored with a fence. Okay, so in each of these cases, one, three, five, six, you, uh, in all cases, if R sub R had been previously crossed, then R would have become exposed. Further, if we charge a corner C of this guy to my right, uh, then it will not subsequently be crossed because I establish a fence to protect it. So it's, it's got a fence, it becomes an obstacle. Now look at a red rectangle. Red rectangle, remember, is one that is nested horizontally to the left, to the right, or both. It cannot be charged more than twice. So you, you're never charging um, a corner of... Uh, involved in a nesting relationship. If you just look at these cases, the, the R sub R that you're charging is not nested within R. So you, you might be able to, so here his right side is nesting. You might charge these two corners of him on his left, but you'll only charge one side of him. And that, that's going to come up right here. This is almost the last slide. So let's account for all the rectangles that are crossed. Red rectangles are of two types. They're either uncut or they're cut. Let H0 be the uncut, H chi be the cut. The non-reds are either uncut or they're cut. Remember, all cut rectangles are discarded. Our goal is to show that the number that survive the uncut rectangles is at least k over 10. Now, for each of the non-red rectangles, remember my charging scheme, I was dealing with non-red because the red guys, I do, because of the nesting, I, do, I can't find that feature to charge it to. But the non-reds, I can find a feature to charge it to. And I'll charge them off, I'll charge one. So this is where you would instead want to charge the weight in the weighted case. So charge one for each time you cut a non-red rectangle. So the total charge overall will be just the number of cut non-reds. And the total charge is at most two per, two, two, you know, two times H zero, two times uh, the number of red rectangles, uncut reds, and four times the number of uncut uh, non-reds. 
because you're only charging uncut rectangles, but there's the red and the non-reds, okay? Only two charges go to the reds and at most four to the non-reds. Now, a finer analysis here would actually partition the reds into those that are double red in both sides and single red. And that's where uh, I'm virtually certain I, I can improve the 10. At, at some point I thought I had a factor three, but I'm not sure of it. So I just wrote down the 10 I was sure of and I'll try to refine the analysis. So the true constant should be somewhere between two and 10. Um, so what's the total charge? This is what I just wrote. The total, so we have this. This inequality I rewrote here. There it is. That's the same inequality. I just added two uh, H zero to each side. Here I added M zero and subtracted M zero. So that's an equation. And this inequality comes from my assumption, which was without loss of generality before, that the number of non-reds M, the crossed or not crossed, is at least K over two. So this term is at least K over two. That's this inequality. Now look at this versus this, and that's what I wrote here. So the 4H0, I took uh, the um, uh, subtracted 2H0 to get this 2H0, the 4M0, I add this M0, I get this 5, that's where the 5 comes from, is greater or equal to K over 2. Manipulate manipulate. And here, here's where some slack, there's some, some slack in my analysis. So there's two places there's slack. So one is in the charging, where I can do a refined analysis of that. Um, and the, and I may be able to, to partition into a finer case analysis with respect to the red, blue, and gray. The other place I'm giving up something, but I don't think this is important, is I'm giving up something here. But I get this inequality, which is exactly the final claim. So that's QED. So the number of uncut rectangles in total is at least K over 10. That's the charging scheme that leads to the proof of the main theorem that you get constant factor approximation in polynomial time. So as I've already said, the approximation factor can almost surely be improved. Um, and uh, perhaps a future uh, posting of, of it will have a factor better than 10. Like I said, I think it can get down to three. Maybe there's a way to go to two plus epsilon or even one plus epsilon using generalized CCRs. So a CCR you know, is a rectangle with one notch cut out of each corner. Well, what if you allowed cuts that had a constant complexity? Yeah, so much like my M guillotine type methods for PTASs, if I generalize to partitions that have constant complexity cuts and let that constant grow, you might go towards a PTAS or two plus epsilon. The issue is that I'm still at the, at the, at the beginning of this argument, I had this dichotomy of either you're nested horizontally or vertically, and I was sort of giving up on one of the two. So I feel like without another idea, this might be stuck at a two, but I do feel that there's room for improvement. And um, several of the things that I've tried uh, are pointing towards a potential p-test. If you would ask me to speculate, I'd, I'd guess that there is a p-test. I don't think uh, that's without, uh, you know, that's out of bounds. Uh, the weighted version, I think, you can get a constant factor, whether you can get a PTAS or not, that's a huge unknown, I don't know. I mean, so for the weighted case, uh, Timothy and Sariel have, uh, you know, it's a, it's a slightly inferior uh, approximation bound, you know, versus the log log n that was uh, previously known. Um, but can we get constant factor or something better than this? Uh, I believe so. Higher dimensions, I really haven't thought about it all yet. Um, and of course, we can come right back to that conjecture that would give an alternative proof to, to all of this, um, and which would be, uh, is the conjecture about perfect BSPs true or not? So let me uh, pause there, that's the end, and take any questions. That's a very interesting talk. 
and thank you again. Yeah, yeah. yeah sorry about that. Um, so I have a question. Uh, an actual thing would be to try and uh, stop hiring this hierarchical partition, mm. similar to what you did in the TSP, right? Where yeah. you not expose a vertex, but something like one over epsilon expose a vertex. Exactly. Well, so, so that's exactly uh, right. So that, that that's exactly what. So so expose right now is that a corner you know sees to the to the, to the side. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have a notion of uh, M exposure where you cross at most M. The problem is that, 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 that um, you have to be careful that these rays that are defining the charging uh, do not coalesce along. So you could have a tall vertical uh, rectangle that is receiving many of these rays. So you need to make sure that you don't over, you know, recharge something. So I've come up with other schemes in which you uh, you define this constant complexity exposure path. So from a corner of of my rectangle, which right now my exposure path has complexity one, it's just a horizontal segment, but I, I'm defining as an M exposure path, just like you, you mentioned the bridging the the, the PTAS and some other. I, I mean, I've played with so many variants of this that you know I, I could go on for hours about the 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 things that I've tried that don't quite work. So there's there there's a large enough set of them that almost work that you know it, 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 you know ha, have I epsilon sampled the the the, the space of, uh, of 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 possible approaches? I don't know, but I, I think it's very very close. Um, and I think something along these lines is going to is going to work, but I may still be giving up this factor too. So whether this leads to the two plus epsilon or a one plus epsilon is something I'm actively working on right now. Thanks. Other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, so first of all, thank you for a great talk. Uh, I, I am wondering if uh, any of these techniques could possibly lead to a constant approximation for the heat inset problem uh, that goes beyond the epsilon net technique. Again, something that I've that, that I've thought about off and on for a while, um, maybe you know. So so this is this is very hot off the press. So um, I, I have a queue of questions to, to think about in the hitting set problem is, is, is certainly one of them. Uh, offhand, I'm not sure. Um, but you know, I'm optimistic that the technique will see other uses. Thank you. I mean, one, one question that uh, is, is whether, uh, the, I mean, there's another interesting open question here is uh, the integral dig up of the LP relaxation. Right. Uh, I mean, of course, you're using DP, so it's not obvious um, uh, how that would translate to answering the integral decap question. But uh, right. there could still be some uh, many ideas here that could show that, at least in the unweighted case, the LP integral decap is constant. That that would be quite interesting. Yes. Um, but I haven't directly thought about the integrality gap. Um, you know, other than, you know, that, that was one approach, uh, of course, that I think many people who have thought about this problem have, have considered. But um, here I was, well, basically I was stuck about this BSP conjecture, the perfect BSP conjecture. And I just tried to tweak that to, uh, to get something that would at least give a constant factor approximation. But uh, yeah, I, I don't see that it says anything about the integrality gap. Thank you. It was a nice talk. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. All right. So instead of improving the approximation factor, what about the other direction? Since the case analysis is fairly long, have you, <laughs> you have a sense of how things could be simplified if you allow for larger, uh, but still constant approximation factor? That's a good question. Um, 
Yeah, you might be able to to boil my you know 60 figures down to a handful if we allowed a bigger factor. But you but what um, hmm. it all comes down to what you know who, who's going to pay for a crossed rectangle. I guess maybe related to that uh, is this sort of like maybe high level intuition as to, in, in some sense, you know, if, if, if you want to boil down the geometric inside and say, oh, look, if I have a CCR, I can cut it into constant number of CCRs uh, so that somehow things are not crossed too much, right? Right. And I guess the main question is why it's only a CCR as opposed to like some staircase like structure, right? Right. Um, so, I mean, that's maybe where, you know, even if the constant is very bad, it, 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 you know, beyond the case analysis, which I kind of couldn't keep up with, right? Is there some uh, rough intuition that led you to believe that, oh, that is plausible or, or you had to carefully verify everything and only then be sure, I guess you had to look at this five a split case, something, I guess in one well, of the- Well, but, but I didn't discover the five split case right away. So um, I, I had an earlier write-up where, I, you know, I, I had been a little bit sloppy in one of the branches of the case analysis and I didn't have that one there. Um, so um, I've gone back through it very, very pedantically, you know, mm. Uh, it, it, it makes if 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 you're sleepless some night you can look at the the <laughs> the, um, the the appendix where it goes through exactly you know what the the, the whole tree of and, and I'm sure that that my case analysis is probably more complicated than it needs to be. Uh, I stopped when I found the first working case analysis that I fully believed. Um, like Timothy said, maybe there's um, a, a much simpler uh, way to see perhaps a weaker constant factor. This was really an exploration to, to, to prove the existence of some constant, because that's obviously something that we just didn't know before and, and I had banged my head against for, for a number of years. So I stopped when I got the first thing that I fully believed and now I'm, I'm fine tuning. 